Acts chapter 1, verse, verse 1, reading through verse 5, the Bible says, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible. The word infallible means inarguable. Amen. Cannot, cannot be argued with. Many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait from the, for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And I'm just going to, we're going to do a study. Uh, I don't know how many weeks it'll, it'll last, but uh, at least for tonight, we're going to be studying the book of Acts uh, of the Apostles. Amen. Can we lift our hands one more time and love the Lord Jesus? We love you with all of our heart. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. Blessed be the name of Jesus Christ. God, we ask you to anoint this congregation. God, anoint our hearts. Help us to receive the word of the Lord. God, anoint your servant again tonight. Let me speak the words as you've given them to me for the sanctuary tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. Brother, si brother, brother, sister, brother Rick and Sister Mandy is not here tonight. They are out of town on their, uh, I think it's their 15th honeymoon. Hallelujah. They are, they're, uh, I'm not sure whether it was yesterday, today, or tomorrow is their anniversary. So they went out of town. Matter of fact, ladies, they're paving the way for you. They went to Amish country. So they paved the way, uh, scouted it out, made sure there was no pitfalls. And when they come back, they'll tell you uh, what to go look at. Uh, but that's where they're at tonight. We're so thankful for Brother Rick and Sister Mandy and, and what they mean to this church. Amen. Tradition has assigned the book of Acts, <coughs> not just tradition. I guess I shouldn't say tradition maybe. But, uh, but when King James had the, uh, the Hebrew text uh, translated, uh, the book of Acts, we call it the book of Acts, but it's been attributed to the Acts of the Apostles. Matter of fact, that's what, the way the high headline in your Bible will read, uh, the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, and because of this, we sometimes tend to look at the Apostle Peter and, and we look at the Apostle Paul and, and all the other Apostles as being uh, the sole reason that the church had revival. Uh, I told you just a little while ago that the Lord woke me up one particular night. Matter of fact, it was one early morning, about 3 o'clock. And uh, the thought was on my heart and my mind. Of course, I'm always preaching revival and I'm always uh, pressing for revival. And uh, it was vividly uh, impacted on my mind that particular morning that, uh, that we can't have revival uh, when two-thirds of the church only shows up one-third of the time. Uh, that's all that the Lord showed me. And, and we certainly understand, saints of God, if we're going to have revival, and I believe that is the heartbeat, especially of those of us that are here tonight, uh, I believe it's your desire to have revival because we realize that in order for our loved ones to be saved, in order, in order for our loved ones to receive the Holy Ghost, we have to have revival. Amen. There's got to be a move of the Holy Ghost. Uh, but it, it's going to be uh, by the whole church. It's going to have to happen. I realize that revival fires can start with one person. Uh, they've used the analogy before of a forest fire starts with a spark from one match or a spark from uh, a lightning bolt or something like that. It just takes one little thing to start and destroy thousands of acres of forest land. We see it every summer, uh, especially out in the, the, the west where uh, thousands of acres of national forest is burned every year. And, and usually it is because somebody doesn't put a campfire out or uh, maybe somebody smoking a cigarette, flips a cigarette out the wind of their car and it lands on some dry leaves. Uh, a little bit of breeze blows on and that, 
uh, that's the starting of a forest fire. I believe revival can start by one person in a prayer room or a prayer closet or a living room or a bedroom at home saying, God, I want revival more than I want life. Uh, I believe that could be the start of revival. But, uh, but in order for a, a city to have revival, it's going to take a collective body of believers. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit. Uh, but a lot of times we look at the Acts of the Apostles and we think, well, it's because they had the Apostle Paul. It was because they had the Apostle Peter. It was because of Barnabas. It was because of John Mark. It was because of these other uh, great men of God as they went and, and walked the countryside preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and certainly that had a part of it, but, but these men had to have a body of believers that backed them up. Uh, these men were very important part of the revival, uh, but the book of Acts really should be known as the Acts of the church. It is uh, a group of people. That every, every time that Paul preached, he was preaching to a group of people. Matter of fact, even after the book of Acts, Romans through the book of Revelation was written to churches and they were body of believers like you and I here tonight, full of the Holy Ghost, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, loving the Lord, trying to live according to the will of God. So uh, when we look at all the great things that happened in the book of Acts, uh, it was because there was a church that was on fire. The Bible says that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. We saw on the day of Pentecost, or we read on the day of Pentecost, that some 3,000 was added to the initial 120 that was filled with the Holy Ghost in the upper room. Uh, it was another instance where there was 5,000 that was added to the church, and, and the church began to grow. And as the church began to grow, it, it, when a church begins to grow, it is, it is like a snowball effect. I remember this, cho this church, this local church years ago when we first started. We started in the living room of Burton and Ethel Copen out on Chestnut Run. Uh, and in that little uh, living room, it wasn't a little living room, but it was, it was, a, it was a living room. And, and uh, there would be people standing on the porch listening to the preacher on the inside of the house. And, and, and someone said that there was upwards of 50 people on one Sunday morning uh, or Sunday afternoon in that setting. And we went from there to uh, a tent revival out on Route 5 just past... Uh, uh, the storage buildings, I think there's an old sawmill sitting there in the high grass now. and uh, We had a five-week tent revival, and, and it began to snowball. We went from there to the little trading post, which was uh, Caddy Corner from the Exxon down there, and we had uh, as high as 74 people in that building. And, and uh, the very first Sunday we had service in here was October the 5th, 19, I can't remember exactly the date, 74, somewhere around there. Uh, there was over 100 people here that particular day. And, and, and we continued to grow until about 19 and 98, 99, I think, was the height. We had an Easter Sunday attendance of 198 people. Uh, but people was coming in because their friends and family were getting the Holy Ghost and seeing miracles and signs and wonders, and, and it was a snowball effect. And, and, and certainly, I'm not making excuses, but, but certainly as the church begins to grow, it begins to become uh, more effective, if not more easier, to continue that growth. Okay? So, uh, it shows what happens. The book of Acts shows what happens when the Holy Ghost and a whole lot of ordinary people take the message of Jesus Christ to their world. It doesn't take anything fancy. It doesn't take uh, a, a big budget, a church with a big budget. It doesn't take a church with, with uh, a beautiful edifice, which we have a very, very nice place to worship the Lord uh, it doesn't take all of that. It just takes ordinary people. And, and we oftentimes think, well, the Hopkins, I don't have any talents. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not a speaker. I, I don't have any charisma. I don't have any ability to go out and win somebody. Uh, God doesn't ask us to, to be anything other than ourselves. Hallelujah. He doesn't want us to be something that we're not. He doesn't want us to be fake people. The church in the book of Acts was just, I believe, ordinary people. 
Amen. We don't hear about the elders in the church. We don't hear about uh, the usher or the Sunday school teachers. We don't hear about the musicians, if there were musicians in the church, which I believe there would be. Uh, There was no mention, Brother Daniel, of a sound man in the book of Acts. But all of these people occupied these churches, and they had revival. I like the mission statement of the United Pentecostal Church International, whom I have my license with. The the mission statement of this organization is the whole gospel to the whole world by the whole church. Hallelujah. It takes every single member of the body of Christ to see revival. Amen. The Bible teaches us that we're all members of the body. Amen. Members in particular, but necessary for the body. Amen. Every one of us, if all we do is pray and come to church and be faithful to God in our, in our attendance, in our giving, amen, you're as much a part of the church as anybody. Hallelujah. Just because pastor is up here preaching tonight or teaching doesn't make me more important in the body than anybody else here. We're all laborers together. We're all members of the same body. I certainly can't do anything with my left hand. Hallelujah. If something would happen to my right arm or my right hand and I would be ineffective with my right side, uh, you wouldn't want to see me eat until I practiced. Hallelujah. Matter of fact, I'm so bad with my left hand, I probably couldn't slap my face with it. I'd probably miss it. I just can't use my left hand. But I promise you, I don't want anything to happen to my left hand either because I find myself using that left hand as a support to my right hand. It doesn't replace my right hand, but it certainly supports my left hand. Those of you that are in the congregation that may be left-handed and you can't do anything with your right hand, you certainly wouldn't want to give up that right hand because many times that right hand acts as a support to your left hand. Man, we need believers. We need saints of God. We need children of God to be faithful to the house of God. Amen. Because, Brother Hopkins, I don't do a whole lot. You may be a left hand in the kingdom of God, but that left hand is certainly important, amen, in the, in the body of Christ. So <clears throat> what Acts is probably one of the most timely books even today. Uh, because the Bible or the book of Acts illustrates what happens when everyday people that are filled with the Holy Ghost apply their faith. Just just believe God simply enough to say, Lord, if you said it, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to do it. Amen. It it may work. It may not work, but I'm going to try it anyhow. Hallelujah. Amen. Those, Those that never fail are those that never try anything. And I will tell you right now, you will probably fail more than you succeed. I used to tell my son when he was playing little leg, I said, if you take the bat off your shoulder, you got a 50-50 chance of hitting the ball. You either will or you won't. But I said, you got a 100% chance of missing it if you leave the bat on your shoulder. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If we never witness, if we never testify, if we never talk to anybody, amen, there's a 100% chance that you won't ever get anybody to come to church. Hallelujah. But if you at least put forth an effort, trust God, believe the Lord, activate your faith, and tell somebody about the Lord, they either will or they won't. But according to the word of God, and this is not in my notes, but according to the will of God, if you at least make an effort, it relieves you of the responsibility for their soul. If they say no, then their soul will be required at their hands. But the Bible says of of the watchman on the wall, if you see danger approaching and you don't warn the people, their blood is going to be required at your hands. So we have a responsibility. But it's, it's just ordinary people, saints of God. Amen. There, we are enamored. People in general are enamored with what I call flash in the pans. People that can kick and jump and run and squeal and hoot and holler. Amen. We just fall in love with them, and that's the best thing since sliced bread. Hallelujah. I got another one now. Jason's not going to like this. 
Amen. It's better than hamburger buns and a hot dog cover. Hallelujah. That's terrible, isn't it? Amen. That's just something Jason and I know. Janie, my wife, knows also. Amen. But people, ordinary people, amen, filled with the Holy Ghost, the more of the church that gets involved reaching our world, amen, allows the commission of Matthew 28 19 to become more reachable. Hallelujah. He said, go into the world, all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. We have a responsibility. It wasn't a suggestion. It's not called the great suggestion. It's called the great commandment. We have a responsibility of reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the reasons that starting a home missions church is difficult, at least starting a home missions church the old way, is when a couple goes into a city, usually it's a husband and wife and maybe some young children, maybe they're by themselves. And it's very difficult for two people to reach a city. If just two people came into Elizabeth, West Virginia and started a church from scratch, Elizabeth has about 950 people in it. Imagine the odds of those two people being able to reach such a group of people and multiply that. Take two people, husband and wife, go into Parkersburg, a city of about 35,000 people. And they try to build a church and try to reach people. Uh, but here's how it happens when the church begins to grow. Uh, as the church begins to grow, it allows more laborers in the field of harvest. If, if you had, I remember years ago when, when I was just a kid, uh, we used to, my, my dad was raised or grew up down in uh, the bottom of Bogle Ridge. And he would always go down, my mom can remember, we'd always go down in the springtime and we would plant potatoes. I think we were, uh, I, I think we were uh, planting enough potatoes for Grant's army. I don't know how many potatoes, Sister Campbell, my dad would plant. But as far as I could, uh, of course I was small. It may not have been as big as patch as this building, but, but it seemed like a huge patch of potatoes. And I would go out there and I would, I would, I would feel overwhelmed as a child but when I was told we got to go out and hoe potatoes. Imagine how bad I hated that trip. Hallelujah. Amen. Maybe that's why I can't grow a garden. I don't really want to grow a garden. <laughs> I told my wife, I said, I have to go. I, I went last night and, and hoed the garden. I said, I need to hoe the garden before we water it tonight. I went out and hoed the garden to come back in. She said, well, I'm just getting ready to come out and help you. I said, well, i got to go and apologize. I said, I've told the church the only thing I can grow is weeds. My, my weeds ain't even grown this year. That's terrible. But, the, but as the more, if you put more laborers in the potato field, it doesn't take near as long to hoe the potatoes. Hallelujah. Understand what I'm saying, and I know I got, I got off track there, but as the church begins to grow, it allows more laborers in the field to produce a greater harvest. At the beginning of the book of Acts, the followers of Jesus Christ, amen, of, uh, uh, appeared to be confused and afraid. Because Jesus, whom they had walked with for three years and talked with and heard teach and saw miracle after miracle, amen, was now gone. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to turn. They didn't know where to go. Amen. So, matter of fact, the Bible says in one instance that the disciples were hiding. They were fearful for their life. They thought that their life was going to die or they were going to die. Peter, I believe it was, says, I'm going to go fishing. Hallelujah. Amen, that's the only scripture people have to hold on to, amen, to, to back up going fishing during church time. Hallelujah. Amen. Peter said, I'm going fishing, so I'm going to be like the apostle Peter. Uh, but they were confused. But in verse number 8, the Bible says, God gave them a promise. Uh, he said that you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses. Not you might be or you could be or if you practiced hard enough or uh, if you went to enough seminars you could do it. But, but he says when you receive the Holy Ghost you're going to receive power and you're going to be witnesses of me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. 
Amen. This promised power that he said he would give them was not speaking of military strength or being able to press barbells or lift weights or do anything like that. Amen. It was not any kind of political authority, but the word power does mean spiritual authority. He gave us or he gives us the right or the authority to witness to those that are unbelievers. Uh, Remember the disciples at one time asked Jesus if it would be he that would set up his kingdom, thinking they they were thinking that his purpose to coming to this, this earth was to deliver them from the oppression of Rome. They want to know, Lord, when are you going to set up your kingdom? But This is not what Jesus was saying. The word power means the ability or the authority. And when when it's combined with the acts of witnessing, the word power means that after we receive the Holy Ghost, he will give us the ability and the authority to be witnesses of him. Amen. When he told the disciples, I'm going to give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. Amen. He said, I'm going to give you power to, to, to do miracles and to heal the sick and to raise the dead. He wasn't saying, I'm going to give you the might to do it. It's not by might nor yet by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. He said, I'm going to give you the, the authority. When you are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and you take upon him, his name into your life and, uh, in baptism, you have the authority and all the authority of that name. That's why when we call on the name of Jesus, amen, miracles happen, demons tremble, and situations and circumstances changes when we call on that name because we're invoking the power of the name. Only the children of God have that power to invoke the name of Jesus Christ. So he said, you're going to have power after that, the Holy Ghost. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you don't have the power. But if you have the Holy Ghost, you have the authority or the ability to tell someone about Jesus. It may not be as eloquent as as someone else, but eloquence doesn't have anything to do with it. It's the authority. Now, let's take a look at the word witness. He said, you're going to have power to be witnesses of me. The moment we hear the word witnessing, what comes to our mind? What, What comes to your mind when I talk about witnessing? Amen. To some people, we have visions of standing on street corners preaching to people in the marketplace. Sometimes we think, well, it's going from house to house. We're knocking doors this weekend and we're witnessing for the Lord. Witnessing is not inviting people to God. Hallelujah. If you if you invite your neighbors to Sunday school Sunday morning, Don't come to church and say, Brother Hopkins, I witnessed to my neighbor this week. You didn't witness to them, you just invited them. You offered an invitation. That's not the same as witnessing to them. Okay? Uh, So it's not preaching on the street corner. It's not necessarily going from house to house. That might be avenues that you could use, but that's not what it entails. Those things are good to do, but there is more to witnessing than preaching on street corners or with this loud microphone. There's more to it than that. The testimony of our conversation is without doubt the greatest form of witness that we have. You don't have to be able to quote scripture after scripture and memorize entire chapters of the Bible in order to be an effective witness. Do you realize that, the, that your witness is the only thing that Satan can't steal from you? He can steal your, uh, he can, he can steal your talents. He can steal, steal, he can steal a lot of things from He can even steal your healings and miracles. But a witness is simply telling, if I witness to you, I'm going to tell you what the Lord has done for me. The the conversion or the testimony of the Apostle Paul. Every revival that Paul preached, it all entailed, I was on my way to Damascus, and I was going to put the Christians in jail. 
But on my way down the Damascus road, a, gr a great light shone and knocked me to the ground, and I was blinded. And the Lord began to speak to me out of the, out of the light. And, and I went in, and, and I was baptized. And he was speaking about his conversion. He didn't, he didn't give grace. He said, I don't come with you with enticing words of man's wisdom. Paul wasn't a fancy preacher. If you, if you read and study some of the messages that the Apostle Paul preached, amen, they weren't eloquent. He probably wouldn't have been invited to the general conference or even a district conference to preach. He just, just plain old soup, bean, and cornbread, if I can use that terminology tonight, just down to earth, this is what the Lord has done for me. And everything that Satan threw at Paul, the many times that he was beaten and left for dead, the times that he was shipwrecked, the times that he was rejected by his friends and his family, those times that, that he was imprisoned, amen, all of those things that Satan threw at him, yet Paul maintained his witness. This is what the Lord done for me. Amen. There's a lot of things that I can talk about tonight Amen. There's a lot of things that I could discuss. There's a lot of things. I'll, I'll, I'll just be honest with you. There's some things that Satan has stolen from me. But I still have my testimony. I still have my witness. Hallelujah. Amen. We had a great service Sunday morning. But if you'll notice, Brother Christ, amen, in his message, he talked about the word of a king. But the majority of Brother Christ's message Sunday morning was what the Lord done for him. What God delivered him from, death, and, and restored him back to his wife and his children and the ministry. Amen. And by hearing that, what happened? Our faith began to rise. Hallelujah. Amen. Our faith began to shore up, and, and we stepped out in faith, and God began to do great things amongst us Sunday morning. Why? Because of somebody's witness. Amen. Brother Christ, I guess you could really be technical about it. Brother Christ really didn't preach Sunday morning. He witnessed to us. He told us what the Lord did, and God done great things. So your witness is the most powerful thing that you can use to tell someone about Jesus. If he's delivered you from a habit, amen, you can tell people about that. If somebody is, is bound by habits, you can say, hey, listen, let me just share with you what the Lord done for me. I used to be uh, bound by this, or I used to be bound by cigarettes or alcohol or drugs, and, and God delivered me from it. When I got the Holy Ghost and, and I repented of my sins, I left the altar, and I never desired that ever again since then. You're talking about a power to somebody that's addicted to a, to a habit. Amen. You're talking about a powerful witness. And you can follow that up by saying, listen, if he did it for me, I know he can do it for you too. Hallelujah. One of the greatest, I remember as a child growing up in church, one of the greatest uh, things that I remember in growing up was people would bring people to church that needed healing because we were seeing miracles and people being healed and they would encounter somebody that was sick during the course of the week. I know that if you'll come Sunday morning and let the preacher pray for you, amen, God will heal you and certainly they would come and the preacher would pray for them and God would heal them. Why? Was it because of the preacher? No, but it was the power of your witness. Everybody understanding what I'm saying? I want to go on, but, but there is nothing any more powerful than your witness. Let's look at a witness from another angle. Amen. A witness is simply one who bears testimony or gives evidence. If you're ever called to be a witness in the court system, they want you to give your eyewitness account of what you saw. They don't want you to make up stories. They don't want you to make up things that you think you saw. They want you to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And they cross-examine you, trying to catch you in a lie, trying to catch you in a way to where uh, that, that you have to recant your witness. But, but the Holy Ghost gives you the ability through your daily walk with Him and through your daily relationship to present evidence to the lost, what Jesus Christ can do. 
That's what God's called you to do. Amen. Certainly, uh, evangelism is a process. It's not just an event. Revival is a process. You talk to your church. Revival's a process. It just doesn't happen. Hello. Amen. When you go out tonight and you get in your car to start it up, uh, there's more to it than just turning the switch. And if everything doesn't work right in that engine, you can crank on that thing until the battery dies. It's not going to start. It's a process. Amen. That ignition starts a spark, and that spark ignites, and, and it goes all the way down. And I'm not going to get all the way into it, but it, it, there's a combustion that happens, and there's an explosion inside of your car. You, did, you understand, did you know that? Amen. Inside your car, if you have a six-cylinder, there is six explosions in your car every time that crank turns over. Hallelujah. We didn't know that, did we? Some of y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. But that's what happens. Evangelism, revival is a process. You don't come up to church one night and just say, hallelujah, we're going to have revival. Amen. Everybody gets the Holy Ghost and we walk out and say, man, we had revival tonight. Amen. If we're not doing the necess necessary things, amen, if we're not praying, if we're not fasting, if we're not witnessing to people around us, amen, we're not going to have revival. Hello. Hallelujah. We'll be like some group of people. They don't have revivals. They just have a series of meetings. Amen. Verse 8 says that the believers would be witnesses, not just do witnessing, but you would become a witness. Let me talk here just a few seconds. Amen. It's one thing to go out and tell somebody about what the Lord can do. It's another thing to be a witness. The Bible says to let your light shine before men. And this is the part we really have problems with. But the Bible does say, you can read it for yourself. The Bible says to let your light shine before men that others might see your good works. That's what it says. And when they see your good works, they begin to glorify your Father. Hallelujah. Do we do enough good works to allow people to glorify our Father? Amen. What's it talking about? It, 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 when, when we talk about works, we think, well, Brother Hopkins, that's, that's legalism. We're not into works. It's, it doesn't, you, you're not saved. I'm not talking about salvation. Amen. But works is talking about being a witness, living a life, amen, that others know that there's something different about you. You can be real, and they still know there's something different about you. Verse number six, well, let me, let me say witnesses, it's a lifestyle. Being a witness means that your lifestyle is different. It's not just an occasional effort. That's witnessing. But being a witness is a lifestyle. Verse six, the apostles were mainly concerned with the restoration of military domin domination of Israel over Rome. Verse number 7, Jesus tried to change the narrative when he said it's not for you to know. How many times are we guilty? Listen to me very carefully. How many times are we guilty of trying to figure out things that were in, never intended for us to figure out? You realize it's not intended for us to figure out when Jesus is coming. But we have people that will study, and they'll study, and they'll study, and when they're just about ready to fall asleep over studying, they get a thought that Jesus is coming in September of 2019, and they get up and they preach it, and they think God's, God gave me a revelation. He's coming in September 2019. Amen. If he comes in September 2019, saints of God, this is not a revelation. I just come up with that date. But they run with it. It's not for us to figure out. God says nobody knows the day or the hour. 
and we try to figure out so many things. Amen. God just wants people to love him and just to fall in love with being a child of God and being a Christian and living right and walking right and talking right uh, and spitting white and, and doing everything and coming to the house of God and lifting hands up and worshiping the Lord and, and being faithful. That's what God wants us to do. If we would focus more on that than trying to figure out things that we ain't supposed to figure out, man, the church would have more revival than we do. Man, the focus of the church needs to be on evangelism. We have some churches that are wrapped up in current events, and I don't, I don't believe that we need to be the proverbial ostrich that buries its head, head in the sand. Hallelujah. He, man, I was sitting at my computer today, and, and I was on the weather channel on looking at the weather. I don't know why I was doing that. I knew it was going to rain. Hallelujah, five out of seven days of the week it rains, so I don't know why I even look at the weather. But there was a picture on the weather channel, and uh, there was a tornado in the background, and there was these two gentlemen, I'll call them that, being nice. And one was down on a knee, and they were talking about proposing in the midst of a tornado. And I turned to the gentleman I work with, I said, you know, all these people running around, getting offended at everything that's said, I said, it's time for people like me to point my finger at a picture like that and say, that offends me. And I told him, I said, there's some things in the Bible you can argue about. I said, but that's not one of them. Hallelujah. God's against that. He said, God, it makes God sick. And I told him, I said, you know, some people feel like Christians need to be pacifists. But the Bible says, amen, the kingdom of uh, God, it, uh, my mind just went blank. Suffereth violence, and the violent taketh it by force. Hallelujah. It's time for us to stand up and say we're children of God. It's not wrong for us to be up on current events, but it should never take the priority of reaching the lost. We have churches, and I'm not poking at people. I'm not criticizing people. I'm just telling you the way it is. We have some churches that all they talk about is current events. We don't talk about rapture anymore. We don't talk about hell anymore. We don't talk about uh, being lost anymore. We don't talk about what it takes to be saved anymore. We don't talk about this, we don't talk about that, but we're up on current events. Amen. The number one job of a church is to reach the lost. Everything else is extracurricular activities. Hello. And if we get so wrapped up in the extracurricular that it takes the time out from evangelizing, there's something out of balance in the church. Verses 9 through 11, the angels announced that Jesus would come again and he would appear just as he had left them. Verse number 12, the Bible says, And they returned to Jerusalem from Mount Olivet, a Sabbath day's journey. Now let's look at that four-word phrase, a Sabbath day's journey. Anybody familiar with how long or how far a distance that might be? Any Bible scholars in here? I didn't know either until I looked it up. The phrase is used only one other time in the scripture, a Sabbath day's journey. According to Jewish customs, a Sabbath day's journey was a distance that the scribes thought a Jew could travel without breaking the law. Many theologians agree it was about 2,000 cubits or about 3,000 feet, about, uh, about two-thirds of a mile. It's all you could walk on the Sabbath day. Jesus could have started his church anywhere. But it's, it's noteworthy to, un, to, to uh, say that even though he could have started his church anywhere, he chose to start it in the place that rejected him. Right in the heart of where they rejected him. Most of us would have said, you know, if that's the way you feel about it, man, then I'll just go somewhere else. But Jesus said, you rejected me, but you're going to be the first ones that has the opportunity 
for salvation. After he had came to Jerusalem, the Bible says they assembled in an upper room and began to pray in one accord. We often misquote that scripture. We often say we were, they were in one mind and one accord. That's not what it says. It just says they were in one accord in one place. We're not, they, weren't all, they weren't all thinking the same thing. We all think we got to be robots programmed thinking the same thing all the time, but that's not Bible. Praying in one accord simply means that they were praying not the same prayer. They, weren't, they didn't all have their prayer books reading the same prayer over and over again. Amen. They were, they were praying for the same purpose, and that was the promise of the Holy Ghost or the Comforter. That's what they were praying for. God, send the Comforter. You said you was going to send the Comforter, and we're praying for it. Amen. So they were in one accord in one place. They were in the upper room, and they were all praying, not the same prayer, but they were praying for the same purpose. Everybody in this building tonight, amen, it's got to start somewhere, and it might as well start within the 15 people that is here tonight. Amen. we got to start praying for the same purpose. God, we want to see a move of the Holy Ghost. We want to see revival. Amen. And if I was to ask the question, how many of us have children and family that needs the Holy Ghost, every hand in this building would be raised. I'm not asking you. We're, we're not being asked to pray for somebody else's kids. We're praying for our own kids. I'm not asking you to pray for my family. Amen. You've got to pray for your family. It's your family that's lost. My family's lost. That's why I pray. Amen. It's not, uh, it's not my neighbors that I'm asking you to pray for. It's your neighbors or your co-workers. We ought to pray for the same purpose. Finally, verses 15 and 16, the Bible says, They moved to fill the office of Judas Iscariot, the apostle. Another interesting thing to, to take note of is that the Bible says that they cast lots to choose the new apostle. Up until this point in the Bible, the casting of lots was a way that the people of God trusted that God would make his will known to determine an outcome. Much like, amen, our election cycle. Hallelujah. I pray for the candidate that I believe is right for the position. And, and I'm not talking Republican, I'm not talking Democrat. But when the election is over, I accept the results of the election as the will of God. Hello? Amen. Whether I like them or not, I accept it. And that's what was happening in the Bible. They cast lots and they determined uh, the will of God through casting out lots. They would what what would happen as I studied? Uh, they would put a mark or a name on a stone or a piece of parchment, and they would swirl the items around in a container until one fell out, or they would draw one. The one with the name on it would be deemed to be God's will for that situation. Amen. Casting lots, we see we read about it. Uh, found out that Jonah was the problem. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Even though they, the sailors were sailors and they weren't men of God, they used that and they determined that Jonah was the cause of the problem and they certainly was right. The soldiers, the Bible says, cast lots to see who would take the garment that Jesus wore. It's interesting to note that this is the last place in the Bible Acts chapter 1, uh, it is the last place in the Bible where we see the followers of Jesus Christ casting lots to understand the will of God. It was used frequently according to church history up until this point, but this is the very last time that they used the casting of a lots to figure out or to deem what is the will of God. And the reason why is because this was before the Holy Ghost. They chose the replacement. The Matthias was the replacement, replaced Judas Iscariot. The reason they cast lots was before the infilling of the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost came, he meant the Holy Ghost empowered the, 
the children of God or the followers of Jesus, amen, and gave them direction for his will. As we stand together this evening, amen, from the point of the infilling of the Holy Ghost, lots and fleeces were never used again to determine the will of God. I know there's some people that still believe that they want to put a fleece out before the Lord, and that's fine if that's what you want to do. I'm not preaching against that. I'm just simply stating that it's never recorded in, in, in the books of the Bible after Acts chapter 1 that they used casting of lots or using a fleece like Gideon did to find the will of God. I believe that when you have the Holy Ghost, listen to me very carefully, I believe that when you have the Holy Ghost, you don't have to cast lots. I don't believe that you have to fleece God. I believe that you can be in prayer and God can give you direction for his will. Hello? If we allow the Holy Ghost to lead and guide us, amen, God will give us direction. Hallelujah. The disciples felt that they needed structure. There's a lot of people that don't believe in church government, but there's a lot of, but, but the, the apostles thought it was very necessary uh, for some kind of structure, and through this procedure, Matthias was chosen to be an apostle. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 1, amen, was a powerful chapter. Amen. It is the acts of the church. God wants us to be witnesses. Amen. God wants us and has called us to be a witness. Not just be witnesses, but be a witness. Amen. Walking right and talking right and living right before God. Amen. What does he want us to do, preacher? He just wants us to be love him, be faithful. Amen. Worship him and let our light shine and tell somebody about Jesus. Remember, saints of God, and, and I promise I'm closing. Amen. I'm not in the fourth quarter with two minutes left, and not every team's got three timeouts, like Brother Christ said. I promise you I'm closing. Amen. Amen. But the devil can steal everything he can, but he can't steal your witness. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to think about, if you, if you don't think of anything else the rest of the night, think about that statement right there. Devil, you may steal my health. You may steal my wealth. You may steal my talents. You may be able to steal everything that I have. But you can't steal what Jesus has done for me. Hallelujah.